chapters of Mark. Finally, technology likes me. Somebody's got to. Let me. <laughs> nobody, nobody even smirked because everyone knew. You know, it was like oh, you know, awkward. Anyway, sorry. Let's 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 pray. Lord Jesus, we remember that you said when two or more two or more are present, then you are there with them also. So please be with us this morning by your Holy Spirit. And speak into our hearts and minds, we pray. Amen. Yes, Jesus was most definitely what we might call a nonconformist. And this morning, as we look into this um, last passage from Mark, from Mark uh, chapter 2 and 3, um, I just want to explore why he wasn't. And I think there are basically two reasons. Um, well, there's probably many reasons. But there's two basic reasons I want to look at this morning. Why Jesus was, not a, non, why Jesus was a nonconformist. The first is that the gospel trumps religion. And I'm going to be spending a few minutes talking about that. The gospel trumps religion. And then the second reason is quite simply that Jesus is Lord. So I'll look at these two in turn. Firstly, the gospel trumps religion. Okay, so religion equals things you must do. The gospel equals things done for you. Religion is things you must do. The gospel is things done for you. Now, most people in the world believe that if God exists, we relate to him by being good. There's quite a few variations on a theme, but basically the theme is whatever good and right things that you must do in order to try to garner God's uh, favour or qualify for something, be that perhaps some sort of an afterlife or favour in this life. There's basically a common logic. If I perform, if I obey, then I'm accepted. Now the Gospel says... We just sang it. I'm accepted. I'm fully accepted in Jesus Christ. We just sang. So therefore, I am drawn. I am drawn to follow, to love and to obey. Naturally, because I'm accepted. Because the Holy Spirit is at work in me. I mean, just think about church for a moment. Just to think about a few, ex- working through a few examples. Um, not necessarily this morning. You've, already, you've all done fantastically to be here this morning. But on any given Sunday, do you come to church because you feel you ought to? Otherwise you might feel guilty or maybe even that God will be annoyed or upset with you. That's practicing religion. Or do you come because you want to? Because your heart and soul wants to come and praise and meet with God and your brothers and sisters in Christ who I'm sure are a blessing to you and you to them. That's the effect of the Gospel. Do you sing because you feel you have to? That's religion. Or do you sometimes wave your hands in the air? I wish Pat John was here. Do you sometimes wave your hands in the air? Even though no one else is. Because you've just got to praise and worship the glorious God. That's experiencing the gospel. Do you read your Bibles? I'll assume that you do. The thing is, when you do... Do you find yourself reading it just to get through it? That's religion. Or do you read it because you are inviting God to get through you? That's an effect of the gospel. I just want to kind of go off peace for a minute and share something with you if I can. Um, a lovely snowy day, perfect day to go off piste, as it were. Off piste basically is a phrase that means when you go down the, the um, 
slopes at a skiing resort, you don't stick to where you should, but you go off piece because it's more fun, you know, going where you should. You know. I'm going off and saying to say something to you that I haven't prepared to say. But I had quite a profound few moments. Because what I'm saying, as usual, applies to me as, more, as much as anybody else. I can wrestle with religion, with being religious myself. I'm never doing enough. I'm not reading my Bible enough. I'm not praying enough. Father, I don't talk to you anywhere near enough. Wrestling, failures, feeling wretched, not feeling worthy. Contrary to that song, I don't think that's just me. But this week, um, something happened. As I do that, as I realise I'm doing that, it's very difficult to shake it, but I'm basically focusing in on me. And that's me practising religion, not absorbing the gospel. It's so easy to do it, and I do it all the time. This week, I dawned on me, as I was reflecting on it, what do I want in life? I just want to go and leave this world, knowing that my children love me, and knowing that I love God. So as I wrestle with not being good enough and all the rest of it, it's the fear. Does God love me? I can know God loves me in my head. But what really matters to me is, God, do you know, do you actually know that I love you? Do you ever think about it in that way? As soon as I did, it's, it's so obvious. Of course, God knows I love him. If it's actually genuine in my heart, God knows you love him. I knew in that moment I can die today happy. Any day I'm ready to die. If I know that my, I, my children know I love them and I know that God knows I love them. Because obviously if I know I love God, God knows I love God. Nothing else matters in, in, compared to that. And I will die a happy man as long as I know that I love God because God will know that I love him. That's the gospel. That's the point. That's the gospel. That's not religion. As we sang, God loves us. And if you know you love God, nothing else matters because God knows. That's the gospel. Now, coming back to this passage, the reason I'm talking about the gospel compared to um, religion, the Pharisees were the great bastions of religion. They were trying to enforce their religion to fast, to keep the Sabbath. The Pharisees were like the religious police. And they held power, authority and influence over Jewish people and their practices. And in the passage we see today, they start attacking Jesus and his disciples for picking corn. You see, rubbing corn in your hands was like making your hand a human th uh, threshing machine. And so it was deemed to work. And so it was supposed to be contrary to the Sabbath. Working on the Sabbath. Jesus continually refuses to conform to their oppressive religious policing. Or bow to their self-appointed authority. Jesus basically says, we were not meant to be confined or bound in chains by the Sabbath. But rather that the Sabbath was given as a gift to humankind for spiritual and physical refreshment. And he then says that, well, actually, I am Lord of the Sabbath. And I'm going to say a bit more on that shortly. But with that astonishing claim in mind, Mark then recounts a further occasion where Jesus' attitude and action on the Sabbath calls the religious leaders to be even more furious. And that's at the beginning of chapter 3, where Jesus heals a man with the withered arm. You see, healing was also a form of work, and therefore outlawed on the Sabbath. But look at Jesus' rhetorical question, chapter 3, verse 4. His response, he says, Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? But they remained silent. 
It's a rhetorical question because his answer is clear by his action. Actions speak louder than words. Yeah? Clearly the answer is to do good, to save life. By their strict religiosity and obsessive legalism, the Pharisees were ignoring the whole point of the laws given by God to Moses. Namely, to love God and your neighbour. It's their hypocrisy that Jesus can't stand. Jesus just stares at them in anger and distress, in indignation. An example, uh, uh, example from today would be like, um, if Stephen suddenly killed over with a heart attack, heaven forbid, somebody rushes out, Wendy rushes out to get the defibrillator from the church, or Mike does, and they come in with it, and I go, no, 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 stop there, Mike, no, 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 no one's to touch it, no one's to touch it, no one's to touch Stephen, this is a day of rest, this is the Lord's day. So we'll just say a quick prayer for Stephen instead. But you're not to touch him because that would be outrageous, that would be work. So leave him alone. Ludicrous. This is the type of thing that the Pharisees are saying to Jesus. Would that be loving my neighbour? Of course not. This is what the look that's on Jesus' his face and his exasperation as he's with the man with the withered hand. What he couldn't stand was the hypocrisy. His harshest words were always for them. You see, their example showed that you could actually desperately try to obey all of God's laws and still be miles from him. Because you don't really love what he loves, namely people. Because you could still actually, ultimately be really only concerned with yourself. That's what he couldn't stand. Now, we can, especially myself, all be guilty of that from time to time. And that's why it's right that we need to look into our hearts regularly and ask God to search our hearts, our motives. Because the gospel trumps religion. The gospel saves us and grows us. Not religion. The point for Jesus in both of these clashes with the Pharisees at the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3 is that human need transcends religiosity, legalism. Transcends it. For we are more precious to God and to Jesus himself than rules of religiosity. That's why the gospel trumps religion. And hence... The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But they're seething. The religious and political leaders are seething. The Pharisees, the religious police, and the Herodians, and they were kind of the political um, aristocrats, kind of, for want of a better phrase, in bed with the Romans, um, they hated each other. But the Pharisees and the Herodians they actually collude on the back of this to conspire to kill Jesus. And we're still pretty much at the beginning of Mark's Gospel, chapter 3. Jesus knew from the outset that his ministry was always going to and had to include the cross because he loves us. In a way, what we see in these verses is the best of humanity insofar as how God views us versus the worst of humanity in the establishment's response to conspire and kill. The gospel trumps religion. Okay, but simply put, what is the gospel? At root, it's also why Jesus would not conform which is the second reason I want to finish with this morning. Jesus wouldn't conform because Jesus is Lord. If you had three words to sum up the entire New Testament, it would be these three words, at least for me. Jesus is Lord. 
And the point is central to Mark in his Gospel. It's made continually through the first five chapters. That Jesus is divine, supernatural, and the ultimate authority over all things. In chapter 1, over all previous teachings and teachers, uh, and over all satanic and dark forces. In chapter 2, it covers how Jesus is Lord over sin itself. In chapters 2 and 3, how he's Lord over the Sabbath and the physical. In chapter 4, over the forces of nature. And then in chapter 5, over death itself. Jesus demonstrated his power and authority over all things, seen and unseen, and over the natural realm and the supernatural realm. But I just want to focus on verse 28, that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. His claim of authority there is actually more outrageous than it might first appear to us today. It's basically blasphemous. Because he's not only claiming to be the Lord over the way people lived, lived their lives, but over the God of their lives. And he makes no less of a claim today on my life and on your life. You see here, he is overruling God himself. What God himself had set in motion. For the Sabbath went all the way back to Genesis 2 and the creation event itself. Jesus is saying, I am greater. I transcend all that has come before. Whether that's King David, whom he cites in verse 25, or Moses, through whom God's law had been given. Jesus says, I am the fulfilment of and successor to all of these old laws that were given to God by Moses. Hence, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. What was set in motion by God himself and passed on to the Jewish people through Moses, I am now taking charge of. That's why they want to kill him. It's scandalous. Because from creation is when the Sabbath was set in motion. God marked his achievement in creation by declaring it very good. And then resting. And God is perfect, right? When you're a perfectionist, you can only rest when something has been completed to satisfaction. That's what God did. Genesis 1 and 2. And yet Jesus is saying, right from now on, I am going to be taking and directing the future. That which has stood since the dawn of creation, I am now taking and leading. And I am the Lord. How can he do this? Because he's the one who was there with God before all of creation. Why do we come to church on a Sunday? I know some of you are probably sitting there asking yourself that very question right now. But seriously, why do we come to church on a Sunday? On a Sunday. The Jewish Sabbath was and still is on a Saturday. Well, Jesus changed it. He changed the day of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Why? To mark the significance and glory of new creation. His resurrection. The Sabbath began with God resting from his initial act of creation. Jesus changed it to Sunday to mark God's great act of recreation. His resurrection. Now the Sabbath was set apart to be the holy day. Holy just means set apart. So Jesus always intended for it to be kept. For what it was originally intended to be. A day set apart as a gift for us to rest and remember what God had done. Has done. He just incorporated himself into it. He made it a part of what he has done through his death and resurrection. Jesus then has left us deliberately and intentionally with a dilemma. For in him there are countless blessings. He came for us, for everyone. But he claims absolute authority. He is Lord. He claims authority over all. And that includes you and I. 
So he asks, will you submit? Will you submit today and every day to him as Lord? As Lord of your life? To follow him unwaveringly, to seek him daily in prayer, to know him through scripture and through the Holy Spirit. Great blessings are yours to enjoy today and forever. But he does ask for your commitment, your obedience. He asks for your heart, your soul and your life. And in return, he, and only he, will give you life. Eternal life. Amen. I'm just going to say a a prayer now. If you want to affirm that Jesus is Lord of your life, and I want to affirm this every day, if you do, just echo this prayer in your heart with me now. Father, search my heart right here, right now. Lord Jesus, I want you to know how grateful I am for everything you have done for me in giving your life for me. Lord, I know that you love me. Please help me to receive your abundant grace into my heart. Jesus, my Lord and my friend, I want you to be the Lord of my life. So please abide in me. Reign in my heart. And help me to keep my eyes firmly fixed on you. I lift my humble heart to you now, Lord. And I offer this prayer to you. In your mercy, Lord, hear my prayer.